So, um, welcome to all of you here this evening. This is um, a series that's now in its fifth year. Uh, it's a collaboration between the African Studies Center here at Boston University and the West African Research Association, which is also here at Boston University. The, um, the series was originally called Rethinking Islam in West Africa, and after a number of years, we decided to re-baptize it, as it were, uh, Religion in West Africa. And uh, so this is the second talk in the newly named series. The talk in the fall was on religious diversity in Nigeria. And so it's a real pleasure to introduce our speaker, William Miles, who is a professor of political science at Northeastern University and former Stotsky Professor of Jewish Historical and Cultural Studies there. I think most of you know him, but I'll give a little background. He's also taught at Ben Gurion University, University of the Antilles, uh, the University of Mauritius, Hebrew University in Jerusalem, and Bayero University. So he's taught in a number of different contexts. His work sp spans continents and topics, only a few of which I will mention here. Um, otherwise, we might not actually get to his talk. He's done sig a significant amount of research and writing on the Jewish diaspora communities in Africa and also in African diaspora communities in the Caribbean and Latin America. He's also published on the Holocaust and other instances of genocide, on political Islam, the Hausa, and various other topics. His tenth book, Jews of Nigeria, an Afro-Judaic -Ju Odyssey, 2013, which I think he has an exemplar of. There's my exemplar. Example A, um, was a National Jewish Book Award <coughs> finalist. Five-time Fulbright scholar, Professor Miles' books on Africa include House of Land Divided, 1994, Elections in Nigeria, 1988, and as editor and contributor of Political Islam in West Africa, which was published in 2007. Previous to publishing his tenth book, Jews of Nigeria, he published My African Horse Problem, in uh, 2008, a memoir of his efforts to settle an inheritance dispute in a village in West Africa. And I believe that he spoke on that here, so some of you may have heard that talk um, and about that book. No stranger to Wara or to the African Studies Center, uh, Professor Miles has presented the Rodney series a number of times. He's an active member of the West African Research Association, and he recently presented at a WARC symposium in 2012 uh, entitled César et Senghor à son temps, Perspective transatlantique et pluridisciplinaire. But to go back a bit further, I first met Professor Miles when he was not Professor Miles. Back in 1977, he was training to be a Peace Corps volunteer in Niger. I, at the time, was in graduate school at Indiana University and took my summers to return to Niger to work on training Peace Corps volunteers. So that's when we first met. So that goes back a couple of years. <laughs> it's been a very long time, and it's very impressive to see the trajectory he has followed. Please join me in welcoming Professor Mona. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. And may I ask, in the uh, first in the series, uh, Religious Diversity in Nigeria, mm -hmm. um, did Jews come up? No, it was basic. No, it wasn't. It, Jews were not part of the discussion. It was looking at different um, uh, sort of pre-Islamic groups, if you could call them that, mm -hmm. uh, different Islamic groups and different Christian groups. Right, right. And it was looking at sort of the colonial efforts to suppress religious diversity. Okay. Well, that's that's context that I can fit into uh, as well. Um, on the way over, I realized that were I to choose another subtitle. Uh, than the one you see before, it would be uh, dispersal, disappearance, and renewal. Uh, there's going to feel like a disconnect between the first part of the presentation, the past, and the present. Uh, so, fair warning has been given. We gotta get our signs down. <laughs> so, um, it's a very apt location at a very um, fortuitous time to be uh, presenting uh, here. Uh, first, the, um, we, we go fast. So, okay. Okay. so uh, the place is, of course, at Boston University, which uh, houses the African Histo International Journal of, the, of African Historical Studies, uh, which approached me 
to do a book review. And that's what got me into any knowledge about the topic that uh, I'm going to first present, which is Sahalo Saharan Jewelry. Uh, this is the book that um, somebody out there asked me to review. And I, uh, I did so. Uh, and the timing when I uh, did so uh, what happened to be exactly nine years ago on Passover. <laughs> and uh, those of you who, uh, this is the abstract from the, uh, from the beginning of the actual um, uh, book review. Um, how many of you attended a Seder this year, by the way? Okay, good. So I'll be able to say some things. Uh, not everybody knows that uh, Passover, at least in America, outside of Israel, lasts for eight days. It's day number five. Okay. So, um, if, uh, and those of you uh, who attend know that the way you end the Seder is to invoke a very um, standard phrase. Which is, wait, not, not, not so fast, uh, not, not that fast. What's the standard phrase in, uh, in the Seder? Next year, next year in Jerusalem. So how does next year in Timintin, and what the heck does Timintin have to do with Passover? I have to thank John Hunwick and the International Journal of uh, African Historical Studies for, for, having me introduced, for having introduced me to this part of Africa from a Jewish perspective that I had never ever heard of or thought of before. And to stretch my mental geo-ethnic boundaries. So let me say a, a word or two about that. <clears throat> um, classical division of Jewish ethnicity, European Jewry, Ashkenazi, uh, Oriental slash Eastern slash North African Judaism, Sephardic. And there's nothing new or surprising about Jews having lived for a long, long time in uh, Algeria, in Egypt, in Morocco, in Tunisia. But that's always been a coastal phenomenon. At least I've always thought of it as a coastal phenomenon. Certainly not descending into the Sahara or beyond the Sahara. And, and that's why it takes, it has taken me, and I thank Jennifer for the invitation and the opportunity to explore that Sahelo-Saharan um, uh, angle uh, that I'm going to share with you. And I do this not as a historian, even though some of my best friends are historians, <laughs> um, but uh, as somebody who is trying to get his head around and differentiate between the metaphors, the myths, and the empirics. Uh, separate myths and metaphors from empirical truths, which is a very difficult thing to do when you're dealing with religion and such Latin uh, concepts as the ten lost tribes of Israel, which uh, is a phenomenon that dates since the destruction of the ten kingdoms of uh, northern Israel in 722 BC by the Assyrians. Where are they? They're found everywhere. But that doesn't mean that they're anywhere. Um, and to give you an example of the myth, um, uh, Joseph Williams, a, um, a British uh, Jesuit uh, who uh, published this influential uh, book, very still very influential, regarding the topic that we're talking about uh, today, who marshaled a host of evidence to prove that a lot of the West African uh, cultural groups in the 1920s, when he published this, uh, are actually of Jewish or Israelite descent. And this is the trajectory that Williams uh, traces, down from uh, the Holy Land, from Canaan, from Palestine, from Israel, however you want to call it, through uh, Egypt, and then uh, westward, westward through the Sudan. Okay? Uh, enjoy for what it's for, uh, worth. Very influential for me, very fanciful. So, um, but what about the truth of Jews in North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa in the Sahara? 
um, there is a what I would call a liberal and a conservative school of Sahelo, Saharan, Jewish. Uh, the liberal school is uh, represented by Jacob Ovio, uh, who was only published in French as far as I know. And, and this, uh, he originally published in the late 1990s. Uh, it was, or early 1994, I think, and then it was reproduced, updated uh, in this beautiful um, picture book version, almost as beautiful as Len Mayans' work on the uh, Ethiopians in Israel uh, in, uh, I think, 2004. And I'll explain what the difference is. This, a, uh, a, coll a Senegalese colleague, Idrissa Ba, uh, had published um, uh, this uh, book on following the traces of the Jewish diaspora in Africa in the Middle Ages, published just this year. Uh, and I met um, Idrissa uh, when I was um, spending time hanging out at uh, work uh, in, in, uh, in, in the car. And uh, he currently teaches at the University of uh, Sheikh Antab Jo, Yukal. And uh, there's a convergence that begins between the liberal and the conservative schools. So let me focus on the convergence. The convergence has to do with the fact that, indisputably, after the Jewish revolt against the Romans in Palestine, which is celebrated not as Passover but Hanukkah, um, and their defeat, um, a number of Jewish groups uh, went through the Mediterranean. Some of them settled in what is today um, Libya, Cernica, I don't know how it's actually pronounced in English. And then some of them went uh, further uh, west and uh, we'll see further south. By the way, the color um, are from Oliel, the liberal school, and the black and white, you'll see, are from uh, Ba, Idris Ba, the conservative school. But, but from here on in, but for now, they're still converging. Okay? Um, that the first waves uh, in the first century, and then uh, from to about 300, and then a second wave uh, from uh, around 517, that finally make their way into the Sahara proper. And if there's only one word to remember uh, from my presentation, it is the place name Twat. Twat. Twat, which is the region that was the epicenter of Saharan Jewry for a millennium and a half. 1,500 years, okay? Um, and when they were first fleeing the Romans, they were not the only people who had trouble with the Romans who were conquering Palestine, who were conquering North Africa. Those of you who are starting to that year will know that I'm referring to the other resistors to the Romans, the Berbers. And the Jews and the Berbers, from very early times, made such an alliance, military and then cultural, that there are those who say today that the Berbers are actually Jews who became Africanized. And there are those who say that the Jews, that there are Jews in Africa who were uh, originally Berbers, who were assimilated into uh, that tradition. In any event, uh, indisputably, alliances, convergence between um, the Zenet uh, tribe of Berbers and these uh, refugees, originally refugees, and then traders, uh, commerçants from, uh, from the Jewish communities uh, in uh, Palestine. And, and here is from uh, Idris Abba, another map that shows uh, some of the trading links, you'll have to take my word for it, um, uh, that were used by Jewish uh, traders. And uh, I know the quality isn't good, but this is Tamantit. This is the uh, epigram that John Hunwick uses next year in Tamantit, and I'll get to why they needed to say that. <coughs> Uh, 
uh, Arab references throughout this millennium and a half. Uh, Al Idrisi in 1154, Ibn Said in 1286. Um, this is a map that just shows, again, the trading links that Jews and others were involved in. I won't presume everybody knows French, so salt, uh, copper, gold, uh, um, hides, uh, slaves, uh, ivory. And uh, having just gotten back from Mauritania, um, but not having prepared for tonight, I missed an opportunity. Well, I semi-missed an opportunity because um, part of the mythology at any rate is that even in Mauritania, in the Adrar region, uh, there will be a better map that uh, illustrates that, there are people who are of Jewish descent. So here's uh, Twat again, and I, I, you get a, I, I think you can be impressed by how Saharan it is vis-a-vis -vis classical Sephardic um, uh, Jewish communities. The um, reference to Mauritania, uh, Bafur, a, a mythical, uh, magical group that um, uh, people like uh, Williams will talk about, Oliel will invoke, but people like Ba will dismiss um, as um, pure mythology. But if you want to have an idea of how Jews were envisioned or imagined, in medieval Africa, I'll never say um, Google before, but V A F O U R. Here. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, even a better map that shows um, the Twat region uh, that populated many um, uh, of the Jews. And all along, we have the recounts of the Arab um, uh, chroniclers at the time. Who are not chronically just Jews, they're chronically everything that's going on. And uh, classical entries for 50, for 20 years at a time, war, famine, locusts. And then 100 years of relative luck, war, famines, locusts. Again, uh, very apt for the Passover time, the Passover Seder, you invoke the plagues, and uh, the locust is certainly there. Uh, uh, not having enough food is certainly a, a plague. But that was um, the harsh reality for Jews and Muslims uh, living in the Sahara when things weren't going uh, well. Um, I mentioned the Bafour. Uh, when I was in Mauritania uh, three weeks ago, I, I heard about, and now I've read more about the Mualim. The Mualim. These are more. <coughs> People in Mauritanians today, a low, lower caste, who are thought of, and that's what Muadi refers to it as Jews. Now, why are they called Jews? Um, the liberal view will say that indeed they are descendants of some of these Saharan Jews. The conservative view will say that, well, the term Jew gets misrepresented, misinterpreted, and it's almost a pejorative. But just to know that the, in the Saharan consciousness, there are these, these terms. And that gives me the, um, uh, the, the opening to speak to the divergence between the liberal and the conservative schools. Uh, after I say something about this, uh, these show in more detail the Jewish communities uh, in the Tuat uh, area. And again, uh, as it's blown up, it's, it's hard to uh, see, but Mantit, which had a synagogue built in the 6th century, and therefore was the center. Think of Tuat as the region, and it's Mantit. Uh, that was John Hunwick's focus in that book uh, as the, uh, the, the city center. Of, of, Jew, of Saharan uh, Jewry. Okay. Now comes the really Jewish part, <laughs> or the tragic classic Jewish part of my presentation. 1492, Americans associated with, of course, Columbus. Jews 
associate 1492 with the expulsion from Spain. Muslims were expelled too, uh, but certainly in uh, Western uh, Jewish education, consciousness, 1492 is a year not of discovery of the New World, but of, of disaster. And in fact, that's how Sephardic Jewry actually emerges as a transnational global phenomenon because they had to leave. They had to leave. Or convert, become Muslims, or pretend convert, practice Judaism in private, risking discovery, and that's the term Murano, which is actually which literally is a pejorative term, but I'll use it anyway, Murano to describe those hidden or crypto Jews in Spain. Now why do I go into that now? Placeholder, placeholder. 1492, you know, when I studied African history and I was introduced to uh, Askia Mohammed, um, uh, emperor of the uh, Songhai Empire. Interesting. Interesting. And I remember reading about the great Islamizer, his counselor, his advisor, Al-Maghali. But it wasn't until I realized that Al-Maghali was beyond the expulsors from Spain. He was what we would call today a genocidaire. And his notion of purifying, Islamizing the Sahara until this. Rise up, kill, and enslave the infidels. Pigs who care not for the name of Muhammad, rise up and kill the Jews. They are indeed the bitterest enemies who reject Muhammad. I'm, I'm quoting from John Hunwick's translation a moment ago. Rise up and kill the Jews and all of those who fight for them. Thus will you please Muhammad. And we did. In 1492, one of the strangest coincidences, ethnic cleansing, of that Jewish population that had incontrovertibly flourished in Tuat for the 1,500 years approximately, it ended. It was very effective, very brutal. And what happened? <clears throat> Did he kill them all? No, indisputably not. The technology wasn't there. But what happened after 1492, when that community was uh, decimated? So here you have the real difference between Oliel, the liberal, and Bob, the conservative. Oliel says that the survivors traveled, survived, integrated into Tuareg territory and Tuareg peoples as far south as near Timbuktu. And uh, the Adrar, this is uh, Mauritania, uh, where I, I wish I could go back uh, to one of the areas uh, mentioned here. And so there is definitely for him a, uh, a, a Jewish link among the Tuaregs. Uh, there is a Tuareg Jewish queen who is often invoked. <coughs> um, others also speak of the Jewish Fulani 
connection that probably predates 1492, but that would have been intensified with that. And Idris Abba himself, a Fulani, um, is very familiar with the supposed overlaps, linkages, and putative um, uh, shared origins of the two. But remember, he's the conservative. He's the conservative. Um, be that as it, as it may, again, here's the detail of uh, where, according to Oliel, you have this Jewish presence among the Tuaregs. And he'll go even further and say that in the uh, old empire of Ghana, which didn't even include present-day Ghana, but much of uh, Mauritania, part of uh, Mali, um, there was a, a present, a Jewish presence there as well. So Idris Abba, he, he studies it, he goes to the sources, and he dismisses it. Uh, he admits coincidences uh, and uh, intriguing commonalities of customs, symbols, iconography, but he's no Oliel. But we can confirm the return at the beginning of the colonial era of a Jewish presence in the Sahara, starting with this cool-looking dude of a rabbi, Rabbi Mordechai Abi Ben Sarur. Mordechai is the Arab version of Mordechai, who uh, grew up in uh, Algeria was a rabbi, um, but it didn't mean the same thing then uh, as today. You didn't really make a living as a pulpit rabbi in, in the Sahara. His day job was a caravaneer. He knew his camels. And he brought the camels as a guide down uh, many times to um, Timbuktu where he established a business and convinced his brothers and his cousins to come on down and established this, uh, his homestead, and which I, uh, and I took this picture um, <coughs> just three years ago in Timbuktu. UNESCO is debating turning it into a, uh, a World Heritage Site. Because indisputably, the 1860s through the 1880s, Timbuktu knew Rabbi Moshe. So did the French Geographical Society, who hired him to take underground, undercover, the first French discoverer, quote unquote, of Timbuktu at a time when it was still forbidden for non-Muslims to go there. <clears throat> and this uh, French explorer, he was a captain, I think it was, in, in, in the army. He was an overt anti-Semite. But, you know, you deal with what, you, you go with the guide that uh, you have. And in order to do this, this rabbi taught the French Catholic, how to pass as a Muslim. So that the two of them, being able to go to uh, Timbuktu, uh, were, uh, were doing so under this disguise. And it worked. Um, Rabbi Mordechai also um, wrote these discourses, and he wrote in, in Hebrew. Uh, translated to French, although he certainly was Francophone as well, about what he called the Dagatun. And I think the next uh, uh, slide, yes, the next slide, goes back to, it's, we're talking about the Daga, Tuaregs, uh, a, a lower um, a family group uh, among them. Um, 
And most historians and anthropolo anthropologists um, don't accept that the, the Mordechai thesis. Oliel does, but again, the conservative um, is not. This um, Malian author, Ismail Diadye Haidaran, who descends from a long line of keepers of Timbuktu history, uh, published this book about uh, 15 years ago, based sheerly on the documentation that he um, has in his first family and then foundation collection. Uh, this is uh, Ismail um, signing my copy of his book in Timbuktu. And I was very lucky because he spends half of the year in Spain because he has many links uh, with um, his Spanish counterparts uh, looking at the Andalusian, old Andalusian uh, connections uh, between Spain and, and Mali. Um, these are some of the documents of, of his collection. Uh, those of you who know anything about Timbuktu, they're, they're known for this. And he used these kinds of documents to write that book about the Jews of Timbuktu, which resulted in threats, including death threats. Here is uh, Haidara, whose point is Timbuktu has always been open and pluralistic and accepted Mordechai, Mordechai in those times. Uh, and his family. Um, it, it was because it was the French Catholic who was trying to be smuggled in that um, they couldn't be uh, open as Jews. And here now, in this age of uh, Islamic extremism, there are those who don't wish to acknowledge the past presence of Jews in Timbuktu. And that's the reason that he's gotten these uh, threats. But incontrovertible it is that he uh, and others were there. This is, uh, he just picked this out at random from that stack. Um, those of you who know Arabic, or at least can recognize the Arabic letters, uh, some of you will recognize the Hebrew letters on this same document. In the uh, late uh, 1880s, these uh, great engravings were made. Remember, uh, I said the placeholder for the Muranos? This is the equivalent of the Muranos. This is a Jew identified as a Jew who converted to Islam, but is known as a Jew or a former Jew. Uh, here is his wife, and here is probably the first picture, uh, photograph, of a, uh, of, of a Saharan Jew. 1923, um, taken in this uh, part of Algeria. But they're gone. There is no Saharan that's the disappearance. And now, the shock to the renewal. That there is, in our times, um, a revival of Jewry of a very different nature, uh, more among in tropical and savanna Africa. Um, <coughs> some of the scholars who have been pioneering this work, Tudor Parfit, um, Edith uh, Bruder, who was his student, in, uh, and uh, this map is from her uh, book. The next map is the extract that I uh, snipped and want to uh, <clears throat> focus on. First saying that we can dismiss, or I, I dismiss, those uh, members of the Zahar community outside of Timbuktu, who call themselves Jews, who will not marry outside of their community, who identify as Jews, 
but practice Islam. So somewhere along the line, they either learned or picked up this ancestry that is intriguing, but doesn't cut the mustard for me when it comes to talking about what West African Jewry is. But in Cameroon, we can, and we do. And I do this by channeling, channeling uh, Nathan Devere at the University of Utah, uh, who, is, who has provided the next um, couple of pictures for me. All the others, are, uh, uh, and, and the rest of us here are mine, of the Bet Yeshurun uh, community whom, uh, who date the 1990s. The 1990s. When some, uh, particularly a man named Sa, was um, surfing the internet, which had just arrived in the community about uh, uh, an hour from uh, Yamude, and found problems learning about Judaism, Mosaic law, mm, discrepancies with the faith, the Baptist faith, into which they had been, uh, into which they had raised. Uh, they, are, they are members of the Betty group, uh, which is the group, it happens to be the ethnicity of President uh, Paul Bia, who is known for being a Judeophile and, and dabbles in the Kabbalah. I don't know what that means in Cameroonian um, uh, uh, context, but without a doubt, he's close to Israel, uh, former Israeli defense attaché. Avraham Avi uh, Sivan has trained uh, he, um, Abiyah's um, uh, personal guard. And um, ne next slide, just to show some of the, uh, some of the female members of this uh, community. This is Serge's wife. Serge is the current leader of the uh, community. And here you will see him, uh, both here in Sa. Cameroon, and down the street at Northeastern University. Mm -hmm. So there's an organization, Kulanu, which brings, uh, uh, among the things that it does, it brings um, members of remote Jewish communities uh, into the so-called mainstream Jewish world. Uh, Serge Atelli was converted to Judaism officially in New York City, the new mecca of uh, Judaism, um, or the old one, uh, a conversion which is symbolic but problematic for reasons that I will go into. And I say that as a New Yorker. The new mecca, not the new Jerusalem. <laughs> <laughs> the new Jerusalem. Uh, next slide, just to show uh, 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 him. Uh, in here. So, uh, the, the only other thing I want to say is that um, his certification as a conservative uh, as a conservative Jew, and he studied the rabbinate, um, is, uh, uh, is problematic also for the House of Israel of Ghana. And here I'm channeling Janice Levy, who has worked on the House of Israel. And this is the only shot that I've taken from the internet. But she couldn't. Uh, she changed the file of um, computers and couldn't um, send it. So um, this uh, Jewish phenomenon began in the 1970s when one of the leaders, a practitioner of traditional um, Sefwi religion, uh, Sefwi being a, a subgroup of the uh, Akan, um, he had a vision in which he was told what he was doing is good and he should continue, and it is pleasing to God, and it is Jewish. Now, what did that mean, that is Jewish? He didn't work on Saturdays. He avoided certain meats. And he, his Christian brothers, like those in Cameroon, started having a problem with the notion of a man-God. And their identity, their religious identity, like in Cameroon, and like, as we'll see in Nigeria, revolves around 
this differentiation from a Christianity, which increasingly they understand as a superimposed colonial phenomenon. Or at least the more sophisticated, more historically oriented ones. Uh, most observers, practitioners, are more interested in the laws of purity, of, uh, of dietary laws, being faithful to the religion. Um, those of you who uh, did attend a Seder um, know that you eat matzah and you drink lots of wine, but that we don't slaughter a, a sheep or a goat as the Old Testament says that we would. They do. Or at least as of four years ago, that was their understanding of how you celebrate Passover. And that's how it was done. So um, now we'll go in, uh, and I'll do this rapidly because I did present uh, on Jews of Nigeria three, four years ago. Actually, it's amazing how time flies. But um, I don't know, those of you familiar with Nigeria might know this phrase, well, fill in the blank, the Igbos are the Jews of West Africa. Uh, for reasons that have nothing to do with ancestry, or at least at the time had nothing to do with ancestry, but rather with entrepreneurship, education, uh, cosmopolitan uh, migration. Even though there was an escaped Igbo slave, he wrote an autobiography invoking Israelite um, beliefs of origin, another African uh, who became a historian who did the same, and finally um, a um, missionary who lived among the Igbos for many, many years. And doesn't say that they are descended from Jews, but invokes lots of commonalities between Igbo tradition and uh, Israelite uh, practice. Um, they invoke the tribe of God, one of the lost tribes, but they're only invoking it over the last 30 years. Um, this is the other tribe that they could invoke as Igbos. Um, but now we're going to listen to a snippet of a song in the next... Uh, uh, and, and what you have to do is click on the image itself if we've got volume. I didn't, we didn't check that. And listen to the actual tribes that these young Jewish Hebo children are singing about. <laughs> and therefore I call them Jupiter. <laughs> this is their synagogue. Over the threshold it says all, is, all of Israel are brothers. Um, Israel shall live. I visited the first time it was Hanukkah. And here is uh, Sar Habakkuk, a venerable member of the community uh, who built that synagogue, blessing uh, the children on a Hanukkah Sabbath uh, Eve. <clears throat> so um, this is Dr. Caliban Ikeju, Ikejuku, excuse me. Uh, who is a surgeon. And uh, this is a, a quote from him. I always liken my people to that bird that lived for centuries with butterflies and started thinking it is one. But butterfly knows, no, this is bird. 
The best thing is to be ourselves, meaning Jews, not assimilate, and to live with the truth. He um, ordered uh, a whole set of the Talmud, and he specified to me it was the Babylonian Talmud. Um, this is a uh, Sorry, sorry. I'm not sure. Oh, this is a uh, gentleman who really understands uh, Jewish life very well, you know, quite uh, internationally. He's basically saying, uh, we've got a good community, but there's too much quarreling. How come we Jews can't all agree on anything, such as uh, Nigerian Jews are always quarreling. We need a teacher to unite us, as if. <laughs> this is the shrine uh, outside the synagogue that you'll not find uh, most anywhere, or anywhere, but it's part of the syncretism that uh, is an important part of um, Judaism in Nigeria. This is Nambe Ibe. It's not because of my wisdom I decided to join the religion. Only the Holy One of Israel knows why he chose me. All of them had been practitioners of Christianity before they find, found what they see as the truth. Um, Encyclopedia Judaica, in the house of one of uh, them. This is in synagogue. You don't see that much in Newton or Brookline. <coughs> uh, or, or this. And uh, this is a photograph that you'll recognize of a bar mitzvah, the first bar mitzvah in that synagogue, and I was privileged to attend it. And uh, here is the bar mitzvah boy. And in uh, rapid uh, form, you will be privileged to attend the bar mitzvah as well. Um, if you click on this, to um, attend four hours of ritual um, uh, for the full bar mitzvah, but uh, we have to be respectful. This is um, the bar mitzvah boy's mom. Um, as sort of as a plus, in order to be bar mitzvah, all you have to do is give the blessing, but um, he is so adept that he can even read from the Torah. And this will be the last video clip that I'll show. Let me just click on the black. <laughs> He's a happy boy. He's done it all. Um, and he did a lot more than that. So, the future. I've got a great mic on five minutes, and I won't even take five minutes. Um, speculative. Uh, but some things are less speculative than others. The, the, certainly what is true is that there is interest in this phenomenon, and uh, that includes the African Studies Association itself, where um, uh, in last uh, November, um, a number of us uh, presented 
Um, Lynn Lyons is here, he was on the panel too. And I took the um, position, I take the position that we should understand West African Jewry in terms of uh, NRMs in the uh, religious studies literature of the new religious uh, movement. Um, here was the lineup uh, for uh, panel number one, um, including our, our own Usman Usman Khan as discussant, and uh, panel two, uh, Len Lyons is gracing us uh, with his uh, presence uh, as well. So uh, certainly work is being done on it, and thanks to Len, um, the Jewish community at large and the most uh, important um, website, a disco back called Tablet, uh, picked up on the uh, ASA roundtables um, and posted it. And Len, you said it was, had more hits than Almost anything I've seen, there were 7,000 7, Facebook shares, which means that 7,000 people posted it, which astounded me. Um, and I had no explanation for that unless there was a computer error. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the future. Um, next slide. Remember Hezekiah, the Bar Mitzvah boy. Is he, no, go back, go back. Is he actually a Jew? See, this is one of the problems that uh, West African Jewry is going to have to confront in uh, the cleavage that exists worldwide between Orthodox and non-Orthodox Judaism, particularly when it comes to recognition as Jews through either uh, matrilineal uh, descent or through conversion, through Orthodox Jewry. So you've got all of these communities in Cameroon and Ghana and Nigeria, just to stick to West Africa for the moment, who think of themselves as Jews, who live as Jews, who practice Jews, but who are told uh, <coughs> by the keepers of Jewish law that they're not Jewish. So what are they going to do? Are they going to continue despite that rejection in the face of it? Or are they going to retreat? Uh, will there be some bending uh, on the halachic front? And then there's a the security future. Um, remember what I said about Ismail Hydra and the death threats that he got, or the threats he got. I have to look back whether he said death threats or just Menasu um, But certainly now we're in a climate in which even being a, a moderate Muslim can be uh, risky with Akim, Boko Haram, and others. Well, you know, up until, up until now, West African Jewry has been under the radar. It's been under the Jewish radar. It's been under the African radar. Nigerians, for the most part, don't know that they <coughs> exist. Well, well, what happens when they do have this kind of notoriety? Are they going to be left alone? Th th this is a, a, a future issue to, uh, to confront. And the last um, is what I call the Zionist future. I mean, you cannot, in the 21st century, discuss Judaism and the Jewish communities without the relationship to the Jewish state, which is Israel, which for now does not recognize these communities of Judaism practicing people in West Africa as Jews. Therefore, it does not uh, extend the law of return to them. It, uh, it disenfranchises those individuals, individuals because as communities they don't want to, uh, pull up shop and move to Israel. Um, what is that going to do for their sense of recognition? Which they do want. Cameroon, Ghana. I didn't find that so much in, in Nigeria, at least for now, but um, that is uh, one of the issues for the future that needs to be um, discussed and considered. And I think I'm within 45, you know?
really a, a wonderful um, presentation of this background and then the, the current situation. Uh, really, really interesting. It makes it reminds me of uh, probably around the time when you were trying to be a peace volunteer and I was in grad school. I was also taking Hausa, and there was a woman in our Hausa class who always was asking about the Jews in Hausa land, and we all thought, you know. <coughs> whatever Louise. <laughs> um, but increasingly, this has become less of a, what, we thought, what we have interpreted to be like, well, what is she talking about? You know, that this is Warren's investigation. There so is a, a collection um, of uh, Black Zion, it's called, Edith Bruder and Tudor Parker together, they compiled it, and there's a chapter that revisits the Bayajida myth yeah. of the origins of the House of People through a Hebraic lens uh -huh. um, by a prominent uh, his, uh, historian. Um, but I have to out myself and say I'm more with Idris Abba, I'm more of the conservative school than I am of the liberal school. Um, there are a lot of mm, things we can play out, but where's the evidence? Where's the evidence? Uh, Jennifer, will you call on the distinguished audience? Mark? Certainly, certainly. We have quite a bit of time for questions, so I know you're. Okay. I have to admit, so. Okay. Uh, I want you to talk more about what you were dismissive of, which is those that are not practicing Jews but may have Jewish heritage, the converts, because you know it strikes me that in the history of Judaism there have been a couple of forms of persecution. You know, the, the Spanish version allowed you to convert, but the German version did not. It didn't matter how long you'd been practicing as a Christian. If you're of Jewish heritage, you're still considered Jewish. And you know, if, if you look at the politics of this in Israel, you know, the, the Ethiopian Jews, yeah, some of them claim to be practicing, but a lot of them really weren't very much. Um, before they came. Before they came, right. yeah. And you know, and then you've got this uh, you know, evidence that this group in Zimbabwe uh, has the Cohen markers in their DNA. and. and their claims that they came from the north maybe actually are true, at least from DNA evidence. And it strikes me that particularly the DNA stuff can complicate this because right. according to you know, the matrilineal passage down, you can <clears throat> prove in some way perhaps, even if you haven't practiced for for centuries. And so I, I just wonder, I mean, you were kind of quick to dismiss those that so are I've, practicing I've, Islam, and I'm just wondering if you could So I, I, I've thought about that a lot. And, and so let's take the implications of what you're saying, which is, which is true. The implication is that there are probably tens of millions of people around the planet who, whose ancestors, either voluntarily or probably involuntarily, left Judaism, but um, who still carry the genetic markers of a Jewish inheritance, a heritage. They don't practice Judaism. They don't think of themselves as Jews, for the most part. They probably are practicing another religion. And now, retrospectively, we are going on the basis of scientific tools and DNA analysis to say, ah, aha, you are actually not the Roman Catholic you thought you were, but a descendant of uh, the Koenig. So, then what do you do? Uh, how do you s retrofit an identity to, to people? Um, that, that's, that's one of the, um, the, the, the problems I have with what I have heard referred to as D, and I heard it in Africa, DNA Jew. I um, posit um, orthopraxis above uh, orthodoxy, that what counts is what you do. And it doesn't matter what you call yourself, it's how you live your life. And this is one of the challenges that I have um, seen emerge from um, West African Jewry where their status as Jews is put into question, even though they practice 
Judaism more religiously than a lot of the people who would put into question the validity of their claims of Jewish identity. So we, we see which side of the politics of Israel you would fall on. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, to me it's fascinating because it just really, I, to relate it, like in Rwanda, there were, during the genocide, people who did not know that their families were Tutsi. You know, I interviewed a couple of people who talked about having, um, that their grandfather had moved them to a new area and become Hutu. You know, and but during the genocide, people said, "Oh well, we knew he came from this area." And they researched, and I said, "So you're actually Tutsi?" So one woman was saying, "All my life, I was raised thinking I was Hutu. Mm -hmm. You know, and now I know that I am Tutsi. What does that mean? I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's, you know, but that, but that's, that's the, but that's the sort of bloodline interpretation. And I think yours is very interesting because it's bringing Judaism back to a religion as opposed to, you know, the the the, the people of Israel." I, I, I don't, it's fascinating anyway, I think that. Can I follow up on that a little bit and just ask you to talk a little bit more about the, the clan or the group in Mali that you mentioned, right. Zohar, and, and how they use this claim of this identity if they are you know, practicing Muslims. Right, that, that, that's what's so strange, and, it, and it, that's... I, uh, Tim says that I'm dismissive of them. I'm dismissive of them in the way that I think the uh, the Beit Yishurim of Cameroon and the um, the Jubos, as I call them, of, of Nigeria and the, and the House of Israel of Ghana, they would dismiss them because they would say we are proving and living our Judaism on a day-to-day -day basis. We are making the sacrifices, and I haven't gotten into the economics of any of because there's a whole economic dimension of what it is to be Jewish in Africa. Um, and the costs, the entry costs, and the maintenance costs to preserve um, uh, what, what, what the religion there. So they would say, who are these people to claim the privileged mantle of Jewry? when they don't do the most elementary uh, uh, practices of, of, of the Jewish religion. It's like they can call themselves Jews, but, but, but what does that mean when you get down to it? Now, the fact that they um, preserve their separateness as Muslims in a wider Muslim community outside of, uh, or, or around Timbuktu, that, that's intriguing. Um, but it wouldn't have to be around being Jewish, per se. They could choose some other identity marker uh, to create the endogeny that they apparently want to uh, preserve. Um, maybe I'm just being too conservative, a Ba-esque. Ba <laughs> Thank you very much. This is very informative. It's making me Thank think of a lot of things. I did find, you're right, I did find in Timbuktu, uh, when I was there in 2007, I did find at the library, Ahmed Baba Library, I did find some uh, materials written in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, I was hosted by Abdel Kader Aydala. I'm sure you, you may know him, a Sabama. Yeah, and so so this is this is interesting. My question is uh, about the fula, the pearls. Yes, I, I like your friend uh, Ba, who uh, uh, linked themselves. So at least some of them, some yes. of my friends, because of their clear, you know, f uh, f physical differences with the rest of us, have always uh, tried to find their origin. And, 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 and in some cases, they have rejected their African groups. I mean, their sub-Saharan African groups. And uh, so I was just wondering if you have any insights on that. Because I have one, actually, a colleague of mine who teaches at uh, uh, College of New Jersey who claims he's fuller, you know, and he said he's Jewish. So is, is that part I, of the... Is am part am of I permitted an anecdote? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Jennifer. Yes. It's Peace Corps, <laughs> 1977. My French teacher 
who has a Nigerian Put. pub. Okay. His name also is Ba. And, uh, you know, I didn't know how open you're supposed to, you can be about your religion in, in, in Niger uh, when I'm arriving as a 21-year-old, but uh, we, we can't avoid the, the topic of religion. And uh, when I told him I was Jewish, Ba says to me, oh, we're cousins. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. See, cousin, what do you mean? He says, well, don't you know that when... This is what he told me. Uh, when most of the Israelites left Egypt and went east, some of them got lost and went west. That's us. We're, we're the Fulani. Yeah, we're the Fulani's who got lo the, the Israelites who got lost in, in, in the, uh, back, back then. So that, I, that's interesting. They're claiming that far back, not not, yes. not after seventy. Yes. Yeah, that's interesting. Yes, and you know, I didn't. I was learning. I was taking it a lot, arriving in Niger for the first time <coughs> coming from the, the states. I didn't know what to make of that, and it's taken me decades, actually, to process that information, having gone back, having um, um, studied. Uh, and read and met with Ba and read some of his dissertation before his book was published. And finally, I actually write up that anecdote in a footnote uh, in, in, in the book about um, uh, uh, Senegal, Senegal uh, and, and the Jewish connection. So you, you have to read uh, Ba's book, his, 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 his tone, which is very, very uh, Formidable. He's a real historian. I'm, I'm, I don't claim to be a real historian. He, he's gone through all the literature, through primary documents, secondary documents. He knows it, but he doesn't accept it. I also recall when we were growing up, it may, there may be also a age grading phenomenon. Uh -huh. As when we were growing up in our generation, we we because we were very close to the Rastafarians. Many of us actually treated ourselves as the lost one of the lost tribes uh -huh. of Israel, uh, and we would sing, uh, you know, uh, for example, we would talk a lot about uh, uh, the history of uh, the Jewish people in, in Israel, uh, and link it with, you know, the the fate of the oppressed people. Okay, and so we appropriated Jewishness, though there was no religious dimension to it. It was common. You know, in our in our generation, I mean, at least the generation of the Rastam, the Rastam, the so called Rastam, Rastam man. These were real Rastam men, not the Ba Five. No, 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 Rasta. We we, uh, we were we were Rasta men. We listened to a lot of <laughs> Bob Marley music, and we smoked a little of those things, <laughs> and, uh, and we thought we thought we were we were we were the oppressed people, and then we but we link that that identity, you know, the identity of the oppression of the people of Israel, that is commonly heard in the themes, in the reggae music. Right. Mm -hmm. And so there was, and I thought this was, you know, but, but I, to me, that, that's an age grading phenomenon. I mean, we, we grew out of it. But it, it, it's still, I suspect it's still there. I'm sorry Tim had to walk at just at that moment, because that's the linkage with Rwanda and the Tutsis. This identification through oppression yeah. of the prototypical mm -hmm. Uh, that's people, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, who, who, who have been oppressed? And I, I have my own rant that I can go on about that. That that is not a healthy basis of identity. Yeah, and the challenge is usually. I mean, the, the, the issue is that usually these groups are temporary, very ephemeral. I mean, it's just generational. And it's, in my generation, it was mixed. It was it was it was a mixture of Muslims, non-Muslim, animists. I mean, because our neighborhood was actually mixed. And the common point that brought all of us together, in fact, all of us went to church on Sunday because it's a fun place to go. We also, we also went to the mosque on, on Fridays because you get free money sometimes. Uh -huh. uh, but at, you know, we were alone, we were Rasta people, we were Rasta boys. Okay. And it's in that grouping that the salient identity that we, that you know, was uh, the, the Jewish identity came up as, as a rallying point. But it's interesting, I thought it was generational, but so, your presentation made me think about all of these things we uh, did culturally. I thought the driving force for us was probably music and the suffering of the people of Israel that we appropriated. 
as, as sufferers too. But to what extent that's, that's the enduring identity that will lead to religious practice is very... Well, when did you religion. stop being a Rastaman? Uh, when I went to the university after the back, when the group was dismantled. Because after the back, after the high school degree, as you know, you get sent to the University of Dakar, or you get sent to St. Louis, you know, so people, you know, so the group gets split. But I would suspect that it's still going on. I would suspect that you would find still, if you go to uh, uh, the Balieu, even in Pekin, you would find groups, young, especially the young people, who feel ostracized or who feel kind of, you know, left out to have at least that uh, identification with the oppression of Israel. Well, I met a Rasta in uh, uh, Gore. In Gore and so he was probably a Baifal. No. Okay. He's a, a, real, a, yeah. a real Rasta. Balmor, Balmor of the Balmor. Balmor type, yeah. It's probably our generation. But, but another, I know this is very fascinating. Another thing I think that's interesting is the fluidity of identities. Because the by far can also be a Rasta, can also um, empathize with the oppressions of, of, uh, of the Tutsi or the Utsi you know, or, or the, the Jewish. Because in the community that we work, again, this was in southern Senegal, Kazamas, I'm from Zigensho. And, uh, when we were growing up, the narratives about religion that we received is very different from the narrative about religion that exists as you cross the border, as you cross the Gambia River. Uh, in our, I remember in our socialization, we were told that this is the same story, basically the local narrative, the local narrative is that this is the same story of righteousness told at a different historical period. And so if you're a Muslim, if you're a good Muslim, so you're a good Jewish. If you're a good Jewish, you're a good Muslim, you're a good animist. That's how we, at least in our socialization, so that going to the mosque or going to the, uh, the church, or going to, it was a Roman Catholic church, mostly. But I think until, until maybe uh, 1999, it was, it was like that. Uh, but I think around 2000, there has been a shift when you have new uh, Jehovah Witnesses uh, settlements, especially in our neighborhood, and that uh, began to recruit people. And I think what happened in that, in that process, the makeup, the traditional makeup of the society that was, uh, uh, where religion was not a central element, I think it became salient, because they would come to people's homes, which was not there before. And then they would distribute literature, which was not there before. Uh, so it would be interesting to go back to Zigan Shaw and keep an eye. Next time I go, I will, I will, I will locate these groups and see if uh, what we did is still being done. Mm -hmm. And in what way has it changed? I wish I know. I was in Zigan Shaw this summer. Yeah, I'm from, I'm from uh, Tilen Kajor. When you, come out, when, you, when you get out of the airport, uh, the small, big hotel, that you pass, there is the military garnison. Mm -hmm. uh, that's my neighborhood. But uh, this is very, very interesting. This is very fascinating. <laughs> Bill, I, I have three um, items I'd love to hear your comments on. But first, I have to say that, as you know, I've, I've heard you speak several times, and I've read a lot about this. But I, I'm button. really happy that I was here today because this put things in a fresh and more general perspective, so I found it really enlightening despite my, all my previous experiences. Well, thank Jennifer, because Jennifer really cast this in, in make, making sure that I did yeah, well, broaden, yeah. generalize, and, and even historicize. Um, that, yeah, that background is so important. Yeah. You know, really. yeah. Well, it worked for me, so thank you. Yeah. Um, so the, the things I'm interested in, um, hearing what you can say about is, um, first of all, to what extent do you see the present day expression of Jewish practice connected to the Tuat community that was so many years earlier? It, 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 was, it was unclear whether you see that there is some real historical connection or maybe a putative connection or 
or maybe none at all, that this was the past and now we have the present where Christians are finding that they resonate more to the um, to the Hebrew scriptures, the old, so-called Old Testament, than they do to Christianity for various reasons. And many of the people in your book about the Hebo are coming from Christianity, which also happens uh, with the Abu Yadaya, who came from a Christian community and converted to Judaism, and it's happened with the Lemba, and, and with African-American Jews, and the followers of um, Wentworth Matthew, who you know, number in the thousands in this country, go to their own synagogues, but they mostly came out of a Christian background. So it's kind of interesting whether you see this as um, their construction, and the, maybe to use the term that Tudor Parker uses, that they are constructed Jews, um, as opposed to being part of the Jewish people. So that, so the connection to Tuat is one. Second, whether you would agree to use the word constructed Jews, because you said you're a conservative in this respect, which I, I take it you meant historically, because in terms of how you view these people, you've also said that orthopraxy trumps um, uh, their genetic legacy. So that would make you kind of a liberal, <laughs> not not conservative in terms of how you view them yourself from a religious perspective. So the third thing is, what is the attitude among the Igbo about conversion? There are rabbis who have visited them, and you know one from Providence who was there recently, I can't remember his name, and Howard Gorin was there, other people who, rabbis who go to Africa, do they want conversion? Um, is it part of their, um, I guess, their agenda as Jews uh, to obtain the the, um, you know, the stamp of approval of the Jewish establishment? So, thank you for writing those down. I don't know if I could repeat them myself. No, I got it. Okay. So, I'll, I'll, in, Please. starting with the last and moving back. So. It goes back to Falun's um, issue of uh, fluidity. Now, things change rapidly. This is a dy these are dynamic communities. My experience, in my interviewing, is that you know, among the Igbos, what I call the Jubos, they don't need conversion for themselves. Uh, when I walked into their synagogue, on Shabbat morning, I was the one who felt conspicuous because of my color. They were davening, praying, in uh, a Hebrew and liturgy that would be recognizable by mainstream Jews throughout the world. And they're still at the stage, or they are at the stage, that the Ethiopians who, who came to Israel initially were, that don't tell us we have to convert, because that means that there's something subordinate or secondary about who we are as Jews now. And, and that's where, the, where I understand the Igbos to be. That said, I know of one who did convert. He had the opportunity to go to Uganda when American rabbis, conservative rabbis, were uh, converting people of the uh, of Yudaya. Um, but when he told me this, and it was in a public setting, he, he didn't say it with pride. He wasn't boasting about it. Um, because that raises a question within the community. Well, is it the right thing to do? Should others do it? For the moment, I think the answer is they, don't, they do not do it. Um, in terms of my inconsistency of being liberal uh, when it comes to Jewish identity and conservative when it comes to the historicity of Jewish identity, well, you, you caught me in an inconsistency of the use of the term, um, but that's, that's where I am. That's where I am. Um, I, 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 I do personally extend Jewishness more to the practitioners than to um, 
self, mere identifiers, as, as I think of it. But that's, that's a personal take. So that um, I think the authenticity of people who are making the sacrifices to practice Judaism and sacrifices that are economic as well as social trumps Bagel and Locke's Jewishness in secular Jewish society. But does it trump America. the rabbinic idea that you either have to be born of a Jewish mother or you have to convert? Does it trump that? It, 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 in, it doesn't trump it in the short term. In the, uh, in the medium term, uh, is, are the Jerry Seinfeld Jews going to be Jewish in, in another generation? Yeah. And then, and then your final question again, I guess I sort of um, answered it. Yeah. And, and I, and I um, foresaw it in terms of warning you of a disconnect. You know, I feel a disconnect even when I present. 1492, uh, Jewishness in this region, Jewish identity. I, I don't see it being continued, and I don't see the tropical and savanna Jews identifying with, it, with that valid history. Um, but it's still a renewal of Judaism. And I don't want to get mystical on you, um, but it's in that sense that there is a, a, a spirituality to a new form of Judaism through a different culture, a different ethnicity, a different race, if we can uh, invoke race. Um, similar to what I, I already had studied in the Antilles of a <clears throat> community uh, in Martinique of Jews who had um, uh, settled there, the double expel, uh, expellees, those who had uh, left Spain, gone to South America, and then made their way up to the Antilles until they were expelled by Louis the Sixteenth, I think it was, who had his own Al Magali, who said, <clears throat> we shouldn't have Jews in, in the colonies. And that was the end of it. About like what had been a, uh, a thriving Jewish community of Sephardic heritage, uh, but, but a, a Brazilian Sephardic heritage in Martin. And then, 100 years later, you've got the establishment of a completely different Jewish community that has no historic well, if you want to go, go all the way back to 1492, yeah. But these are Jews from North Africa, Algerian, um, who left at uh, Algerian independence, went to France, didn't feel comfortable, then migrated to the far west of France, which is, are the French islands of, of America, Martinique, Guadeloupe, and have established a thriving community there. So. Yes, you can think of it as a, a continuation or a renewal of, of Jewishness and Jewish history in those places, but it's a revival, renewal after a, a real rupture uh, uh, in history. Okay. Uh, two questions. Uh, the Almoravid movement, what's the effect of the Almoravid movement? in the dispersal of the Jewish people of that period. That's the first one. The second one is um, the, you noted that there was one map in which you showed some, uh, the, the, the activities in which the Jewish people were involved. What is the role? And, and it was, slavery was part of it. What was the role of the Jewish uh, merchants in the trans-Saharan uh, trans uh, slave trade? Right, right. So the Almoravids, I've been reading more and more about them. I used to read about them a long time ago when I was, when I was learning. So yes, the, the ways that the Jews navigated in the period, remember the, the wars, famines, and locusts, okay. um, uh, for, uh, the Almoravids um, uh, history, that, that fits into that punctuation of difficulty that uh, existed for the Saharan, for the Saharan Jews. 
um, in terms of commerce and trade, uh, they were traders like everybody else. And, and they didn't discriminate in the kinds of goods uh, that they were, 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 were um, trading in. And that, that included, like everybody else, people, uh, along with um, uh, livestock and precious metals. Uh, and, and what is the, I don't know if you saw that on the map, Dra in this context refers to what? Dra. It's the it's a region, isn't it? Well, it is Dra, but this was the uh, Dra is, is a region, but the, the, as a as a commodity. Yeah, on the um, textiles. Maybe take maybe textiles. Where do those maps come from? Those uh, maps tracing the, the the color ones come from Olia. And the black and white uh, come from um, Ba. And some of them actually might be from the uh, from his, his thesis before it was published. He has more maps in the uh, uh, thesis than in the published version. Okay. And not to keep going back. We're almost there. Keep going. One, uh, two more, I think. One more. Again? Yeah, here we are. So, the, so, the, yeah, we found this on the Iran. Blood. Sheet. Sheet. Cloth. So, so linen, cloth, textile, is that? I never, I never thought, used the word or thought of the word in that context. But, but it's, it's, it has a broader context than, than, than just sheets. It's interesting that where you have the, the, the slave origins, is, is that, uh, 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 does it match Cameroon? Yeah. So that, so that could, could that, could that be a, a, a locus of mixing and uh, the effect of the uh, initial traders? Well, um, Again, that's the liberal version that only this, this the that, 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 that established the presence. Um, and, and even Ba accepts that, but it's in terms of the long-term influence of, of what those traders left in terms of uh, heritage and, and, and history. It, it's, it's possible. It's possible, but um, you want to see the evidence. It would be interesting, yeah. And in the Sahara, there is evidence. Okay. Uh, I had a couple of questions. Um, my understanding through being involved in the Saharan Crossroads Initiative all these years, which, by the way, is another group that's very interested in this issue of uh, Jews in the Sahara and the Sahel, um, is that Jewish merchants were absolutely pivotal in the trans-Saharan trade. Um, and if if that is the case, I mean, this what you just said makes sense. You know, being at those pivotal points, both, uh, at yeah. those crossroads. Right. Uh -huh. um, so that's just one uh, sort of comment. Um, the other question has to do with the these current populations, which appear to be not uh, genetically related to earlier populations. Um, you've um, talked about the uh, social and economic costs of being Jewish in, I presume, the Ghanaian case and the Igbo case, and I don't know what other cases there might be, but I wonder if you could say more about that. I mean, given this history of 1492 and really pogroms that took place across the Sahara, um, is that memory in some unconscious way still alive that's co making it costly for people to be, to practice as Jewish? So, Hanukkah, at least the way I grew up, we're taught that we're supposed to put the menorahs in the window to show that we're proud of being Jewish. In Abuja, when I mentioned this at the candle lighting ceremony, they said, oh, we cannot do that. Because 
if we did, people would see the lights and accuse us of being cultists. And being a member of a cult in Nigeria is, is deadly serious. So their fears, their apprehensions of outwardly practicing Judaism um, don't have to base themselves in long-term historical uh, memory of Grums that happened in the general region but a long time, time ago, Nigeria at least is a, is a context in which you have to be careful about your religion, um, particularly if it's a non-mainstream one. And one of the um, programs of the, of the Jewish community, of the Yibos, is to be recognized as a mainstream religion. So as to as they're not. not being seen as a... So they're not seen as a, as a cult or... Um, <clears throat> and, and there are cults in Nigeria, or the belief that there are cults is <clears throat> serious enough to, to cause... What, excuse me for jumping in, but what are the numbers of people you're talking about? Because my impression is it's very, very small, almost enough to be under anybody's radar. Well, that's why that's why um, I said that they have been under the radar. <clears throat> but, how, how that, but they don't want to be signaling to their neighbors, for instance, that they are doing practices that could be misinterpreted as, as, as cultish. Um, and they are conscious of Jew, the Jewish historical victimization. They do um, tie into that narrative, and, and, and they write about that in the <clears throat> description of the Bar Mitzvah, in which the surgeon gives a, a speech in which he um, not so obliquely makes the connection between them as Jews and, Bia and them as survivors of Biaf. Which is, which is very much a part of their identity as Jewish Igbos who have survived genocide literally in their own country and indirectly as, as, as being Jews. So, so how many? Oh, can I go so back to your question? Oh, so how many numbers we're talking about? Know, what do you think of the population among the, you know, not, and I think not all of them are in Abuja perhaps, but uh, you know, Elizabeth Ruder speculates that there are as many as 30,000 of yeah. some form, but, but that's Messianic Judaism, too. Uh, but in terms well, I of hope she doesn't mean, call, I hope she doesn't count Messianic Judaism. No, but she was specifying that some form of Jewish practice. But right. Like, well, in terms I'm, of what you're talking about, I'm, I'm, in, that I'm, that, in that I'm definitely conservative. So for me, for the, by the same token that I do not include the Zahar, people of around Timbuktu, in any counting of Jews. I don't count Messianic Jews, which in the context of Nigeria refers, it's basically Jews for Jesus. Those who say that they're Jewish, but also um, accept and pray to Jesus. Um, and many of these Jews, um, some of these Jews came out of that. That was part of their progression from normative Christianity Protestant or Catholic, to Messianic Judaism, which is not Judaism for me and for mainstream Judaism. And then from there, they've removed themselves so that I put the numbers in Nigeria in the, in the thousands. Three to five thousand. <laughs> countrywide. As an upper. Um, and then... Be, because among Igbos, there you could find millions of Igbos, like you probably could find millions of Fulani, who will say that, yeah, we are descended from Jews, and we're Jewish in that way, but um, you, I, I draw concentric circles. And, and I focus in my presentation uh, on, on the inner circle of those who practice Judaism 
in, in, in a normative uh, fashion. Um, and as close to mainstream uh, global Judaism as, as it is as evolved with all its differences and uh, syncretisms. Maybe last one last uh, comment. The, you, you use twice the concept of syncretism. And it's a concept that I struggle with. I think what you've described is, uh, is a very structured, though, you know, uh, uh, difficult to you know, substantiate because of lack of documents, which the term of syncretism doesn't really do justice, because what is syncretism? <clears throat> how, do you, how do you determine the structure within syncretism? So it's, it's a mixture of a, of a model that is not organized. Right. And in this case, these cases you've described, clearly there is it's a continuation, it's a continuation of practices that are both localized but also tied to the classical uh, Jewish uh, liturgical materials. So I don't think the concept of syncretism does justice to the wealth of information you've presented. Well, we'll have to continue about syncretism and, and its implications. But I'll just give you an example of what I see as syncretism. In Jewish uh, tradition, uh, at the end of um, uh, a holiday, you have something to eat, and you say a blessing, and you say a blessing over bread. Okay, you can also say blessing over wine, but the, 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 the blessing over bread is the standard thing. And you do it. And they do it. But because they're Igbo, they also say a separate blessing over the kolonite, for the kolonite. Because you cannot ignore the kolonite um, if you're a good Igbo, because the kolonite is listening. All right? So now, if, if, if that was the only thing one knew about Jubo Judaism from an outside context, one would say, that's, oh, that's bizarre, that's not Jewish, you know, that's not legitimate syncretism, that's African stuff. But within a larger context where the, the weight, the balance, is normative Judaism, there is room for what I see as Whole and not syncretism. Yeah. No, I, I, I understand, I agree with the process. But, but, but my point is, in anthropological literature in general, uh, syncretism is used to refer particularly to the pollution of uh, uh, major religions as they come in contact with Africa in a different context. Mm -hmm. And so that, so that when you talk about uh, uh, l'Islam noir, or when you talk about uh, Christianity in Africa, it's the secretive, secretive version is really the, the, the diluted version. And, but, uh, you know, my understanding of your presentation and the scholarship across the major Abrahamic faith is that what you're really describing is an enrichment. It's, it's an enrichment of the colonel is significant in local culture and has enabled the Jew, uh, you know, uh, Jewish practices to resonate with the local people. And so it's, it's an enrichment, really, of the process, which I think the term syncretism does not really do justice. I, I haven't found a good word for it yet. Uh, but I have struggled with this concept as I study uh, Islam and its localization in different parts of Senegal and uh, different parts of West Africa. And uh, now, I've been maybe talking to you about it. It seems to me the concept of, at least for, for the Islam version, the concept of Adamization may be useful. Adamization. Adam. In, in, in the context of West Africa, when you look at the Arabic script, the modification of the oh, Arabic script to write, right. yes, Adam, to write these languages, using that as a framework, you can you can you can trace in a tangible way. So from Arabic uh, orthography, only had three vowels, right? 
the Wolof have improved the system from three vowels to seven vowels to write their language. The Hausa have done the same in many ways. The Fula have done the same. That's a tangible improvement. And I think that in the same improvement is an enrichment that you find at other levels, like the colonnade situation. In the colonnade situation, it's less tangible uh, because it's not as visible in the orthography. I mean, you can see that uh, from three vowels, uh, Dhamma, the Sukun, they modify it. So what you're really describing is that that's what they're doing at a different level. So they're actually enriching uh, the Jewish faith, making it uh, 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 resonate. That's what the Wolof did. So that, for example, virtues like uh, like Mun, the concept of uh, enduring suffering, I call that sanctified suffering, which they use, which is a central concept in, in, in Sere Gambia, that in fact the best person, uh, the, 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 uh, the most respected person is really the person who can endure suffering, uh, uh, especially unjust suffering. And, and that's part of the socialization, really, even in this circumcision, it's part of that. And it's believed that if you do that, what you, especially in response to violence, you're going to create reversals of situations. So what happens with Islamization is Islamization actually, they gave it a, a, an official stamp so that the concept of, of in Islam of, of, of uh, sabr, of uh, endurance in, in the path of God, right? Gave this old tradition a religious stamp. So that, for example, uh, people, people, whether you speak among the Muris, uh, uh, the, the, the non-violence tradition the response to violence is actually enduring suffering. So that Bamba, the, the, the whole, the reason why Bamba is so appealing to Senegambia, because he suffered injustice. And I think that can be captured with the concept of it's an enrichment. I mean, otherwise, because in, in a different situation, you have Boko Haram. And, 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 and syncretism doesn't, I think the concept of syncretism doesn't do justice to those forms of enrichment that enables the faith to adapt to the local context in ways that are, that are constructive. And I've been struggling with this concept of syncretism with many of my colleagues because when we say syncretism, what is it exactly? You know, and I think in many of these cases that you, you've described, whether it's Christianity or Islam or across the world, they negotiate in some ways with the local culture, in tangible ways and in less tangible ways. And think the concept of syncretism doesn't do justice to that, to that structured uh, negotiation of different knowledge systems. I, I want to um, interrupt here because we need to close, but I think Len, you had some well, comments uh, relative to that as a last Well, the whole idea of syncretism and normative practice that you observed, um, I think you may have coined the term Internet Jews. I don't know if you did or not. But <laughs> um, is there, in all of the groups who practice Judaism in a form that would be recognizable to Jews elsewhere, I suspect all of this, unlike the case of the Ethiopians, who had their own individual, unique Jewish practice for centuries, so they're in kind of a separate category. Um, but is it true that all of the groups that, who, among whom you observe Jewish practice, are getting this either from people visiting them or from the internet, and that there's no really surviving legacy of Jewish practice among these people? Is that a fair statement? Yes. Yes, so very with the caveat yeah. that they, to my uh, mind, retroactively um, see linkages between their traditional Igbo or Beti customs with like, ancient Israel. As in the Hebrewisms of West Africa, that a lot of them were there. Right. Circumcision. Circumcision, right. new moon, 
uh, festival, harvest festivals. So they see that as the source, whether it is or not, uh, is a different issue. Right. Yeah. But right. the liturgy is certainly the liturgy, required. The, the, the liturgy is, is authentic and, and, and normative. Okay. Thanks. Well, I'd like to invite us all to thank you so much for this really great talk. Uh, I really appreciate it. And there are brochures about WARA and our most recent newsletter out on the table outside the room. If you're not a member of WARA, please consider joining us. So thank you so much. This is this is my